And for threatening change, the reason why we always do a lack acknowledgement is we re-express our commitment to reconciliation as we understand that this is merely just an initial step in walking towards a path of reconciliation together. A lot of our team members are also joining from various other areas around the world. As imperative, we take the time to understand as settlers on these lands, what it means um, to, to walk towards true reconciliation. Next slide, please. And so let's get into it. Today's workshop is an intro into legislation and policy solutions to enable transparency and accountability throughout the fashion industry. We'll have five breakout rooms with various topics, ranging from the EU, uh, the new Euro European Union EU textiles policy, um, talking about inclusive policy making, uh, extended producer responsibility policy, and also talking about various formats of account accountability and transparency. And you'll also be getting a real life example of how fashion takes of how, sorry, of how Fashion Revolution has successfully enacted a global policy to account for more fair pay and transparency in the supply and value chain. So if you didn't know much about fashion policy before, you're gonna be learning a lot of things today. Next slide. And just a quick outline. Um, right now we're gonna be, we're gonna welcome. I'll do a bit of intro on who threatening change is. We'll then have Delphine from Fashion Revolution Global do a presentation on close fair pay. Then Isabel from our team will explain the activity details. We'll have our five breakout rooms. And then those also be ways and we'll show you how to keep the conversation growing. Next slide. And here at Threading Change, our mission statement is what we call the six Fs, a feminist fossil fuel free fashion future that's working towards upholding circularity, equity, intersectionality, and justice in the fashion industry with alignment of um, ensuring that we move towards a circular economy while framing and upholding climate justice, racial justice, and gender justice. And as you'll see from many of the different policies today, while some of them touch on more aspects than another one, for example, the Go Coast Fair Pay one advocates a lot for gender justice and also labor justice. These different issues are not um, separate for they're intertwined. It's important that we think about how we can ensure that policy is intersectional at its root and benefiting everyone in the ecosystem. Next slide. Some of our values, as we mentioned previously, is upholding intersectionality, placing people before profits. We are youth-led, youth-driven, centric and underrepresented voices, and also meaningful collaboration. And today, we're really hoping to dive deep into that meaningful collaboration aspect. And last slide that I will talk on for now, a bit about what we do. Uh, we have a few different programs. Um, our Tri Impact model is known as education, innovative storytelling, and also research and policy. So this workshop is part of the youth engagement and consulting aspect with some of the responses that will be taken directly to some of our partners at the UN and also be helping author a policy report that's looking at um, the landscape of youth in a global fashion sphere and how we as young people can enact change together. We also have other programs that we've done throughout the week as part of Texel Talks with one um, just on Tuesday that was talking about redistributing money uh, and power and privilege in the fashion industry. If you're interested in keeping in touch with our future work, we will drop some links in the chat. And with that, we are so uh, proud to introduce Delphine. Um, so Delphine is a policy and research coordinator with Fashion Revolution Global. Um, and she has a background in environmental policy and her work includes the Fashion Transparency Index and also an upcoming EU-wide campaign on living wage for garment workers. Delphine actually spoke at our Are My Clothes Harvard webinar last year. So we're so happy to have her return and we're looking forward to your presentation today, Delphine. And with that, you can take it away. Great, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really happy to be here again this year. Um, and yeah, I guess there's a lot to, to say about policy in the fashion industry. So um, I don't know, Isabel, if you have my presentation, but um, basically um, Fashion Revolution is a really interesting organization. I think we're um, one of the only organizations that sort of works within and outside the fashion industry as we're able to have direct conversations with brands and we're also able to influence uh, policy makers as well as different NGOs to put together coalitions and really shape what the fashion industry should look like. Um, so with this in mind I'll talk a little bit about what Fashion Revolution does and how it works so if you can go to the next slide first. So yeah, Fashion Revolution works on three levels. So on one hand, we advocate for cultural change, industry change, and policy change. So obviously today's um, panel is more about policy change, but I'd just quickly like to provide an overview as to what Fashion Revolution does in terms of cultural change. So um, 
as you may or may not know, we have um, a platform and we have we have built a, uh, a large um, activism movement around the world to advocate for change uh, within the fashion industry. So this is why we use social media to launch new campaigns on um, to launch new campaigns within the fashion industry and really raise awareness for consumers and citizens to really understand what the human rights and environmental issues are within the fashion industry. So because we really want to raise awareness on these issues, we then feel that consumers and people who follow us can then act as not only consumers by thinking about the way they purchase clothes, but also as citizens and advocate for change within the industry, whether that's by emailing a brand or by emailing um, one of their political representatives and so on. And we also advocate for industry change uh, through our Fashion Transparency Index, which is a report that we publish every year, which reviews and ranks 250 of the largest um, retailers in the world and brands in the world based on what they publicly disclose on their human rights and environmental policies and impacts. So um, we strongly believe at Fashion Revolution that um, transparency is not is not radical enough however it's a necessary first step in order to achieve change within the industry so by being able to publish this report uh, we're able to showcase what brands are actually disclosing on their human rights and environmental impacts and then we use this data um, and we to let trade unions and CSOs know what's actually happening on the ground and they can use this data to then pressure brands based on what they claim. So if a brand claims that they pay a living wage, for instance, in their factories, we have a collaboration with Clean Close Campaign, for instance, that will then cross check that data and whether it's accurate or not. So we have these conversations at different levels. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our policy change work. So um, can we go to the next slide? So we, our policy work is the way we work outside of the fashion industry as we're trying to push brands to, or rather we're trying to push policymakers to make sure that brands are properly regulated. So that's why we're advocating for policy change and really influence governments through different ways. So my expertise is more on EU and UK um, policymaking. So I'll give you a bit of an overview as to how we work on this. And then I'll talk a little bit about our good close fair pay campaign. Um, so if you can go to the next slide and I'll give a concrete example as to how we work this year on influencing legislation at EU level. So as you may or may not know, um, the EU has um, just created and just launched an EU textile strategy, which has been in the making for a few years. So the way it works at EU level is if, uh, if the EU wants to launch a new legislation, uh, they will first uh, put together a consultation where any organization, NGO, can submit what they think or what their demands should be, so what they think this legislation should look like. So we submitted, along with our coalition of, um, of partners that include uh, Fashion Trade, uh, sorry, Fair Trade Advocacy Office, the European Environmental Bureau, we put together a document compiling all our demands as to what this legislation should look like. Then um, we waited for the European Commission to draft a proposal and after it drafted this proposal, we uh, then issued a, an initial reaction with our coalition. So you can read our reaction on our website, which stated that even though we had some of our demands um, addressed within this proposal, it did not address um, well, I did not address uh, human rights uh, issues well significantly in the way we demanded. So what we've then done is we've reached out to different MEPs, so members of the European Parliament, and we are currently having calls with them to explain why the current draft as it stands is not enough. And MEPs then have the ability to shape this legislation further. So at the moment, we're still very much discussing with MEPs how we can shape the, the EU textile strategy and what it should include. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview as to how the process works at EU level is you first um, share your demands as part of the EU consultation, then the European Commission will draft a proposal and then MEPs will react to this proposal. And this is when it's absolutely key for organizations or even individuals to reach out to MEPs if they can and say, well, we've read the legislation and it's, it doesn't go far enough. So you can influence um, how they will vote on this legislation. And then the MEPs can actually influence the European Commission into redrafting this proposal. So uh, with this in mind, um, I wanted to give you a quick overview of our, of our Good Close Fair Pay campaign. 
So our Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign is, um, we are ready to launch this campaign. It's part of a European citizens initiative and it will focus on living wage due diligence um, at EU level for garment workers worldwide. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, I think it's the one before, so <laughs> no worries. Um, but it's, it's okay. Um, so basically what our Good Clothes Fair Pay campaign is demanding is living wage for the people who make our clothes. So at the moment, what we know is the majority of textile and garment workers cannot afford to live in decent housing, access healthcare and nutrition, and some struggle to send their kids to school. So uh, as we know, a living wage is not a luxury, it's a, it's a fundamental human right. And this is why we felt it was absolutely key to launch this campaign um, as the EU has just released a new legislation called the Mandatory Human Rights and Environmental Due Diligence Legislation. Sorry, it's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, yeah, so this legislation will demand companies who want to sell their products in the EU market to conduct due diligence on human rights and environmental impacts. Uh, but we felt that this legislation wasn't going far enough in terms of ensuring that garment workers are paid a living wage. Um, and that's why we are calling for any brand who wants to sell their clothes on the EU market to require, require them to uh, conduct due diligence on living wages across their entire supply chain. So that means that they would have to ensure that they're closing the gap between um, actual living wage, so the wages that current garment workers are earning and uh, living wage and basically, uh, and sorry, minimum wage and living wages. Um, I think, could you go on the slide with, uh, to make this legislation a reality, please? Yeah, sure, I don't know why it's jumping. Great. So the mechanism we're using is a very specific uh, EU mechanism called a European Citizens Initiative. And the way it works is um, you have to create a legal proposal um, with your grassroots coalition. So we've created a coalition with different organizations and we've submitted this legal proposal to the European Commission. The European Commission then has about three, three and a half months to accept or reject your legal proposal. That means that they believe they can create legislation on this specific topic that you're trying to address. So if you want to create legislation on living wages, usually that's, that would be fine. However, if you wanted to create legislation that would relate to something very specific, like your neighbor's gate, they would reject that proposal basically. Um, and so the way it works is we have now submitted our legal proposal. And uh, as soon as the European Commission accepts this, we will need to collect 1 million signatures from EU citizens during 12 months uh, in order for the European Commission to then think about making a legis this legislation a reality and translate it into an EU legislation. So it's a very specific EU-wide mechanism and it's not often used. Um, I think only seven other campaigns have actually succeeded and managed to, um, to reach 1 million signatures. So we're very, very hopeful with this campaign. And uh, similarly in the UK, we have a slightly different mechanism, um, but you can submit a petition on the government's website. And um, you, you then, if you reach, if you've managed to reach 100,000 signatures, uh, you can then, um, it's then debated within the parliament. So for the, well, specifically for European Citizens Initiative, only EU citizens can sign. However, we, um, citizens, not residents. So if you hold an EU passport, you can sign. But we also want to raise awareness on this issue globally as it, as it uh, impacts global government workers. So feel free to reshare the campaign with all your friends, including uh, EU and non-EU friends. Um, next slide. So yeah, um, as I mentioned, so ultimately this will be a groundbreaking legislation because it would be the first of its kind. And even though it is specifically for brands wanting to sell their clothes on the EU market, because the EU is the largest um, purchaser of textile in the world, that means that any brand who wants to sell their clothes on this market would be impacted by this legislation. Next slide, yeah. 
So we will, we are still waiting for confirmation from the EU uh, to give us the green light to start collecting signatures. Um, but we hope to be starting this campaign in June um, or in this well, or this summer. Um, and if so, if you're an EU citizen, you can sign your name on this campaign and help us get to one million signatures. And as I mentioned, unfortunately, unfortunately, if you're not an EU citizen, you can still support us and spread the word. So we have um, we have an Instagram specifically dedicated for this campaign called at Good Close Fair Pay. You can also follow us on our website. So it's at goodclosefairpay.eu. And uh, yeah, if you want to keep in touch on how the campaign is going, feel free to reshare all our content. We will hopefully be launching in the coming months. So let me know in the chat if you have any questions. That's amazing, Jocelyn. Thank you so much. I mean, I learned a lot from just that 10 minute presentation and I'm sure others did too. I'm just gonna share my screen again. And then we'll get started into our breakout room. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, if, if anyone wants to keep updated on the campaign, I'm sure we'll share all the necessary resources and another toolkit that I think would be useful to plug in as well before uh, we jump into the workshop is uh, we do have a policy dialogue toolkit, which has been used by different individuals and organizations who've come together to really raise awareness on specific issues within the fashion industry. And they've used that toolkit uh, as, as guidance on how they can really um, advocate for a better fashion industry as we really feel at Fashion Revolution that we're not only consumers, we're citizens. And ultimately as a citizen, we also have not only the right, but we also have um, the possibility to influence the legislations that impact us and impact the garment industry. Thank you so much. Yes, you're right. It is. It goes beyond just being a consumer. And I think that's the biggest takeaway from today is that there is a global responsibility as a citizen. And I think hearing from all these different organizations that we're gonna hear from and hearing the different policy frameworks that we're gonna be diving into, it will help give consumers an idea of how it's more involved. It's more about putting teeth into this advocacy work and also finding ways that legislation can be a part of mending these gaps. So yeah, as we move forward now into our breakout rooms, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Delphine, again, for sharing all of that with us and sharing the campaign with us. Um, and yeah, we really appreciate you being here because we know how busy you are with all of this. And it is Fashion Revolution Week, so we really appreciate you being here. So, before we get started, we wanted to give a little intention setting of why we are talking about this today. And basically the importance behind legislation and policy frameworks. So we really want to lift up the work that garment workers are doing on the ground with campaigning and coalition building. And basically we see we're at this crossroads with the fashion industry that we need to enact legislation to put in and monitor the ways the fashion industry is running right now, because it is not great. It has a lot of education and awareness behind it, um, but now we have to find ways to actually enact and monitor um, the, the industry and the way it's regulated. So today, to jump into all of this, because it can be daunting and it can be a lot to think about as a citizen, we wanted to introduce you to fashion policy. And we have a bunch of different organizations, for example, Remake, Youth in Fashion, Youth in Fashion for Climate Action, also known as YFCA. And then we also have Fashion Takes Action and Fashion Revolution Canada. So we have a number of different organizations with us who are working within these different frameworks and have something to share related to fashion and policy and also are working to enact this legislation. 
So breakout room one will be Remake, and their room is going to be on accountability and transparency. So we will have these different rooms. Number Breakout room number two is inclusive policymaking with shaping fashion. Then breakout room number three is EPR policy. So that's extended, extended producer responsibility with fashion takes action. And then we have labor legislation and fair pay with Fashion Revolution Canada. They're actually gonna be diving into the good clothes um, fair pay campaign. And then we have lastly, but not least, the EU textiles policy with YFCA. So these are our five breakout rooms. You can pick which one you want to dive into because everyone has their different um, areas of interest. And also if you connect with an organization, you can always go to that organization and learn more of how to even get involved with that organization. So this is an opportunity for everyone to um, build on each other's ideas and thoughts and knowledge build on how we can enact policy and legislation uh, collectively and internationally, as well as across um, the different organizations. So it's a very collaborative workshop we have today. Um, before going into it, I just wanted to give a little bit of breakout room etiquette and instructions because it could be new to everybody. So we will split off into the different sessions with the five rooms and we will have you pick which room to go into. So again, we have remake in number one, shaping fashion in number two, EPR, um, fashion to faction number three, fashion revolution Canada number four, and YFCA in number five. So yeah. We'll be collaborating, we'll be project planning, we'll be holding space for discussion, and you are more than welcome to unmute yourself. We are going to be using a mural board, which I'll get into, and that is just a way to write down your ideas if you don't feel comfortable turning off or turning on your mic. Um, and yeah, and it's just a time to brainstorm and really think through these policy frameworks. Like Delphine said, it's a long process and it, there's a lot of steps to the process. So this is just a way to break it down and make it a little bit less daunting. So here is our mural board instructions. Now this you will see on the middle of the mural board, um, but basically you will have this toolbar at the side at the left of your screen. And this is gonna be your main um, toolkit basically. And I would say you're mostly gonna use the sticky notes or the text box um, menu. And basically you can just drag or just click on the sticky note. You can choose any color, um, you can choose any shape. You can even just choose a body of text. You don't have to necessarily um, use a sticky note, um, but it just makes it kind of fun and it makes it a little bit more striking to see where everyone added in something. The other thing I will add is this right here, which will be at the bottom right of your screen, that is the map of the entire mural board. So mural is a virtual whiteboard and basically you can have different sections within the board. So each room is gonna have your own section. So it is like a mini room. And I like to see it as this little section here, just like a little zoomed out version of the entire um, workshop. And basically each room will be enclosed in a square and you can see which room has which organization and you can just go into that room. Now we are gonna have threading change facilitators in each room um, to share the screen so you can follow along and also just so you know where to go on the board but it should be self-explanatory. And then, yeah, so now we're gonna be joining our breakout room. Um, the host will uh, invite us to join the breakout room. You will uh, choose the breakout room that you wanna be a part of, and then you can click join. And yeah, and then from there, we have our facilitators from each organization. They are all amazing facilitators who will be leading the workshop and 
basically you will follow along, they will guide you, you will participate in any way you would like, whether that means turn off your mic, turn on your mic or just do the sticky notes. And then, yeah, and then we can just have conversations, talk about it. So facilitators will go through each activity. We as Running Change will be there to guide the facilitators as well. And yeah, it's just a time to knowledge build, share thoughts around these policy frameworks that you'll be diving into and learn more about how to get involved with the actual organization. And yeah. Sophia, are you putting together the breakout rooms? Yes, yeah, so the breakout rooms have been set. Um, I'm just putting folks in each of the rooms. Um, so the facilitators are all in there now. So if you are an audience member, you should see this message to, if you go to the bottom um, right corner, it says breakout rooms and you can join. Or if you don't know how to do that, you can let me know which room you're interested in and I can input you manually. Yes, so it's, there's like a little Zoom, the Zoom toolbar. And if you, if, you, if you press the one of the three dots, which says more, and there's breakout rooms, and then that's how you can type it in. Anyone has a question? How to choose breakout room? Uh, Mitch, which one are you interested in? I can assign you. So there's accountability, inclusive policy making, um, EU uh, policy. Inclusive policy making. Okay, perfect. I'll assign you. Anybody else has trouble joining and they want me to sort them manually? No? Okay, Isabel, I will put you in the fashion. Sorry, one more time. Who who was that? What is he making? Um, let's see, Mitch. I just assigned you to the fashion one. Pratik, which one would you like to go to? What is he making? The policy one. Yes. Okay. That's it. There's a few of them. Um, do you want to go to the inclusive policy making, the EU one, or the EPR one? Oh, I think you left already. Um, oh, Yika, which one would you like to go to? Um, I'm, I'm stuck between accountability and so I think I just go with accountability. Accountability? Okay, great choice. Yeah. Um, I think someone. Thank you. No worries. And Delphine, did you want to go to one of the rooms as well? No, I just wanted to say goodbye. <laughs> Unfortunately, oh. <laughs> um, I didn't want to jump off without uh, thanking you again. Sorry, I breezed through my presentation, but I just wanted to say goodbye. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Okay. I, I think I got it. Yeah. So you want the accountability one, right? Um, yes. It says not join. Okay, hold on. That's weird. Um, okay, let me move you and then unmove you one time. Okay. For some reason, I'm not able to move you into a room. That's very weird. Do you want to try maybe exiting and then rejoining? For some reason, it's not letting okay. you. Okay, I'll, I'll do that. Okay, thank you. I'll wait for you. All right. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi. Okay, should we get started? Yes, let's get started. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Well, hello, guys. Um, Welcome to um, our breakout room. Um, so as it said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the EU textiles policy, but also on the topic of degrowth. So it's a bit of a, a mix. So maybe we could do a, a, sh a, a quick round of introductions first. Um, so Tanvi, would you like to get started? 
Sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sanvi. I'm currently a student of biology at the University of Jefferson. And Maxime and I co-founded YFCA earlier this year. And I think it's just been a really fun journey kind of seeing how youth can play such a big role in sustainable fashion and policymaking, because policymaking is one of the best ways to bring changes across any body or any sector. And we're so excited that all of you guys are here and we hope that you really enjoy this breakout room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's indeed right. Uh, then I can follow. So my name is Maxime. I'm currently graduating from the Amsterdam Fashion Institute. And um, I am very happy that we're all here having this conversation on the topic of policies in fashion because it's about to get time for them to um, start to be implemented. Um, okay, so uh, Faris, you already um, introduced yourself to us. Maybe you quickly want to do it one more time for the others. Sure, yeah, I'll be happy to. Uh, so my name is Faris. I also go to the University of Deverson. Currently, I'm studying mechatronics engineering, but as a master's, I'd hope to go for industrial and fashion design. And I'm here to learn more about textile policies and fashion today. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Jeanette, can you turn on your mic or is your internet too unstable for that? Okay. <laughs> Ah, uh, cool. Mm. Should we then start? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I can maybe share my screen of the mural. Uh, oh, uh, let me see. Um, I think but he said um but we can definitely just have a chat about it too if you guys are having any challenges with the mural board um so i'll give you a couple minutes to see if you can figure that out but otherwise we can just have an open discussion about it so let me know if you guys have uh any questions while you figure that out yeah and feel free like to stay unmuted and just chat yeah sorry i just got a message from critique that this room needed help is everything okay Oh yeah, well, um, we have two participants and one of two cannot get to mural. So we're just figuring oh, that out. Yeah. Okay. Um, did, did you give them the link that's like anybody can join? Yes, I believe we did. I think Nimrita just sent that over. I think they're on their phone. Um, so it might be a bit challenging on the phone to access mural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be a bit tricky. I haven't done that before. But I was just mentioning to them that since it's a low number of us, if it doesn't work out, we can just have a chat about it and they can either chat in the chat box or we can take our uh, microphones, put our microphones on and we can talk about it that way. So mm -hmm. see us for you guys. Chat box. Sounds good. Okay. I'll leave you guys to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so in that case, um, we can still kind of continue on with, with that first prompt question. So are there any examples that you guys can think of of where we're seeing policy gaps between what the industry at large or the industry? Um... Uh, yeah, can I speak? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, well, the major gap for me would be education. I feel if a lot of um, artisans don't know um, how. Hello, okay. I am confused. Okay, hold on. New co host. Okay, there you go. Um, and how long we have in this room? I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. We have 40 minutes. So I would say. Let me check the outline. Yeah, until 9 12. Hey, okay, that's good. Um, so we let people choose their own rooms, but shaping fashion has a lot. And then fashion takes action has like none. I know. So maybe you and me can both go to fashion takes action just so it's not so empty. Okay. Yeah, okay, let's do that. Okay. See you there. Thanks. 
Um, oh, there we are. Okay, perfect. So now we have our um, our mural, and we're just about to start activity one. So I just did a bit of an overview of um, EPR and and EPR in Canada specifically. So um, thanks, Anna. Sorry, I wasn't able to share my screen. Yeah, no worries. We, we were just having a little chat, so we'll start now with the activities. So, um, yeah, so do you have the mural board in front of you, Azuma, or because um, we can add comments for you, or we can just, uh, or Isabel, or I. Yeah, Sophia. Azuma, if you don't have it in front of you, I can even type them out, and if you want to say, like, a couple of comments or something that comes to mind, I can just type it out for you. And I know it's that because there's only you, it might feel like a lot of pressure, but don't don't feel pressured to you know answer the questions. We can just have an open conversation if you want. Uh, you can ask questions, um, you know, because it is just you. We have more flexibility that way. I think. I mean, Sophia and Isabel, we can. Um, continue, yeah. yeah, and we'll also contribute. So no pressure at all. Yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, for activity one, um, do you want to just scroll over just so I can read it? Uh, there we go. Um, so what are the gaps we are seeing in fashion between what is currently reality and what we would like to see? So this is more of a, just a general question, kind of brainstorming, <laughs> setting the stage. Um, just in a general sense, what are the barriers that we're seeing in fashion from you know, where we are and how we want to be more sustainable. For me, something that I've been seeing more or that has been, I don't know, coming to mind for me more, I guess maybe because of Fashion Revolution Week's theme this year of money, fashion, power, I think the fact that for so long we've been paying so cheap for clothing and there's a lot of talk about um, prices going up when we do provide a living wage. Mm -hmm. And so I think maybe educating the process behind the clothing so we can understand the labor and the value behind the techniques and the traditions also involved in making a clothing. So yeah, just, I guess like reevaluating how we communicate how a clothing is mm -hmm. made, maybe. Absolutely. And that like and that ties into the materials as well, right? Cuz cheap like cheap materials are, you know, cheap to cheap to buy, but if we want to invest in more sustainable materials or, you know, recycling materials costs money as well. So even more thinking of EPR policy, if there was a tax placed on um, a piece of clothing for a consumer, it's going to be a bit more expensive, but it's going to mean that it's going to fund some um, recycling programs within that municipality. So there's all these all these costs that I think you're right, Isabel, that have to be communicated to consumers. Um, you're paying for, um, you know, the materials and the wages. And, and I think if they have a better understanding of that, then they're going to be more willing to pay for these products and also see them as more an investment as rather than, oh, it's just cheap. I'm just going to buy 10 of these. Like you're, you're going to buy one good quality item um, and you won't need to overconsume, consume, um, which in, in turn won't fuel over consumption or over production as well. So, yeah. I know I have a really quick question slash point. Um, so I met when I met Kelly at Globe Conference, um, the, the Sustainable Business Conference a couple weeks ago, um, there was this thing called the reverse pitch. So companies were pitching different problems they had and kind of having the audience pitch solutions. Mm -hmm. And Patagonia, not Patagonia, sorry, Aterix mm -hmm. and MEC both pitched. And um, their pitches were related to fashion. And they were saying what problem they had is when it comes to textiles recycling or reuse or whether it's just, you know, the post-consumer usage of the product, um, it's really hard to recycle because a lot of garments are made up of so many different things. Mm -hmm. Like if you have like, how do you recycle Gore-Tex? Um, mm -hmm. Like how do you recycle the glue that holds together that zipper? Mm -hmm. um, and is that something that even the consumer has to figure out? Like, do they spend all this time to figure that out? Or how do you make it the company's responsibility? And in this case, the company doesn't even know. 
Um, mm-hmm. So I'm curious on that sphere, like how does FTA deal with that? Because you've done so much textile recycling and what about garments that have so many different types of materials? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And I, I think it doesn't as much fall on, on the consumer for that. Like they can educate themselves, but I think it really has to do with industry um, and brands and there's a certain type of recycling. We've been focused a lot on mechanical recycling, which is actually shredding uh, of materials to make something else. But um, in terms of garment to garment, chemical recycling is is the way to go. And that's kind of the only way to um, um, separate those blended fabrics. So there's, you know, a lot of times you get cotton poly blend or nylon spandex blend or anything like that. So chemical recycling is the way to um break down those garments but chemical recycling is also very expensive um and we're years away from um making that at scale so in the meantime we have um we have mechanical recycling which is what we we've been focused on at fta um but yeah it really just comes down to like the brands are producing these so they should be investing in the technologies that are going to help recycle them. It shouldn't be up to the consumer to pay or to, um, you know, be responsible for for that um, change. So, yeah. Totally. And I guess something that just popped up for me is, do you think that, are you seeing a shift in how brands are designing? So they're thinking of end of life? Yeah, I think it's starting. Like you, you definitely see that. It's hard to know with greenwashing who's actually, you know, doing it. Um, but I think the and and also what if what's on the label is actually representative of what is the, the material, right? So, oh, sorry, um, so um, yeah. So I think that um, brands are using a lot of um post consumer so we're using um recycled pot bottles mm. right which is great um but i think what we want to be seeing is garment to garment so we want to take an old garment and make it into a new garment which again is comes back to the the chemical recycling um and the need for this wide scale adoption um and investment by government and brands but um yeah the we're getting there. Um, definitely, you know, we still need to push from the consumer side as well. If we demand these types of items, then, you know, they're gonna they're gonna have to produce them. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I totally agree with you. There's a lot of greenwashing, and and that's the truth because I don't know how uh, a producer would the full life cycle of a fabric or a garment, how, as you mean I'm a producer, how do I know the end, the full life cycle of my garment? Mm-hmm. I can tell you the quality, but does, is that, actual, is that actually the quality? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is very confusing, even the quality of the cotton being produced. You tell me this is it actually what you used okay yes there are also there are lots of check and balancing from um, various companies who are certified and would go through a lot of screening process to ensure that these things are true mm-hmm. but i know that it is very cost it is cost implicative and mm-hmm. how would a middleman be able to afford a quality uh, um, fabric or attire and the way it's going because there's a lot of evolution how do I, as a middle woman, an immigrant, come in to afford these fabrics? I know what quality is. I would definitely choose quality as against the subsidized and this. But how would I be able to, how do I get this? I don't know. It's, it's just, there's a lot of questions that needs to yeah. be answered, unanswered questions. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, we don't have, we don't have an answer for that yet because these, these things are not at scale. They're not... Yeah available for everybody um which is the problem right because given the choice you know most most brands will choose the cheapest option which unfortunately isn't the highest quality option so um 
yeah, it, it's, it, there are certain standards and certifications. There seems yeah. to be more and more of those coming out. So you can, you know, um, you know, what's in your product and you can verify it and yeah. communicate that, you know, to your customers. But yeah, unfortunately that is still, that is still a big, uh, big question. But I think we'll companies are, yeah, I think companies are still finding their feet. Mm -hmm. they're finding their ground just just trying to figure it all out and it is the truth is it is what life is so we should always accept that we have to try to achieve we are at that stage of that we are still trying to figure out a whole lot of things even if we are certified we are b cup certified we are gold certified for certain things in the fashion industry companies even from the streamline from the management to the least that's the life cycle of the product, who their final consumers are, the supply chain, every value, the value chain of the event. We are still, it's obvious that everybody's still doing a lot of figuring out. So it's allowed. Yes, yeah, it's a lot. Green yeah, washing, and, green yeah. washing paints a different picture. It does, I know, and it's really hard to know who to trust. Um, and you're trying to do your best as a as a consumer and, and as a producer, but it's it's really hard to know. But um, and the a lot of supply chains in the fashion industry are so global. Um, you know, things are are produced onshore anymore because it's cheaper to get somebody in Bangladesh to make the item rather than do it, you know, in your own country. So um, there's those issues as well. But you know, we're hopefully. Hopefully uh, going to, you know, if we can localize these things and get, you know, recycling facilities or, mm -hmm. you know, larger scale facilities in on a more local scale, then it would eliminate that. So it's yeah. all I think I agree with you. If we could localize it, even mm -hmm. from the production, even to the supply chain, instead of even the cost and all of that would be reduced, everybody will be able to make certain decisions based on the economy, based on the culture, based on the system, based on the structure. So with that, if everybody can, then the very good companies that are large and big that can afford these things can start off gradually and be able to reach a wider market. So I think more community-based, if this can be worked on, it will have yeah. a lot of effects because everybody must wear clothes. That's the funny thing. Exactly. And everybody deals with your culture. Everybody mm -hmm. deals with your system. And what applies to you would not, I would not wear a polyester fabric in Nigeria, where am I, my country of origin, because the way the climate doesn't have, the weather doesn't accept it. Mm -hmm. So if all of these things are culturally worked on, I mm -hmm. think we'll have more effects on yeah, Russia, it's Russia. yeah, it's a it's a holistic approach to the solution. You have to look at everything and all connected, and it's yeah. In order to really find that solution, it's yeah, holistic for sure. Um, these are this is a great discussion. I'm, I'm loving this, but um, maybe we should move on to activity two, um, uh, which is in what ways can we duplicate this process? elsewhere. So I'm going to give you a little bit of back before we dive into this question. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on what we've been working on at Fashion Takes Action, and then we can kind of talk about maybe how we can we can duplicate that. Um, Anna, sorry to interrupt. Did you no, go ahead. pull up the PDF? Um, sure, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give an overview of it. But yeah, if you wanted to pull it up just for a visual that yeah, that would be fine. Or maybe yeah, I might not be able to. Sorry. That's all right. I mean, it's not really, it's just words. It's a big report. So there's not much to visually look at. But um, uh, so in 2021, uh, Fashion Takes Action published Canada's first textile recycling feasibility study, uh, which covered two areas. So first of all, it was uh, determining the volume and composition of textiles that are going into Canada's landfills. Uh, and two, we provided a technical review of mechanical and recycling uh, chemical um, mechanical and chemical recycling technologies, as well as automated sortation technologies of textiles. Um, so from this, we determined that 500,000 tons of post-consumer textile waste ends up in Canada's landfills every year, most of which are made from synthetic materials like polyester, spandex, nylon, acrylic, um, and that approximately 330,000 tons of these textiles can actually be recycled. 
So it's a huge portion. Um, and then we determined from the study that uh, mechanical recycling is the most feasible. So like I was saying before, um, chemical recycling offers kind of more of a true circular solution for fashion because you're able to do garment to garment recycling. Um, but to get this at scale and to get the investment that we need um, to get this at scale could be years, we're years away from that. But we do mechanical recycling already. Um, it results in an end product that is used for insulation or under padding. So it's mostly, it's just old clothes that are shredded and put into um, behind walls or under carpet, something that people don't see. Um, and it's more considered downcycled than recycled. So it has very little value on the market. So we already have that technology. So we thought, why can't we use that to recycle textiles? So following this study, um, we are now running a mechanical textile recycling pilot that will result in a new end product that's made from 50% of post-consumer textiles, so unwanted clothes, and then 50% of our PET, which is recycled polyester, which is made from plastic bottles. So our pilot is going to result in a more stylish consumer facing end product that has a value and that can then be sold in stores. Um, so it's a whole a circular approach to um, recite, textile recycling. So um, we focus this really on a local level. And they're also planning on reducing incineration and landfill waste. And um, apart from these, there's a few other specific subsections I'm just going to run through them super quickly before Maxine can take over. Um, the EU has introduced a mandatory eco design requirement. So this basically means that if you want to get your clothes as a producer stamped with the EU's eco design mark, it needs to fit a very strict product design qualification. And part of this design includes the fact that the textile of the garment needs to have an extended life. Um, however, this is not legally binding. This is a voluntary scheme, uh, which is something that a few activists have complained about. Another thing that they've talked about is the digital product passport. And this is a very exciting idea. What they want basically is that for each single garment to have some sort of a QR code or some kind of identifying mark, which lets you know exactly where the garment was made, how it was made, the whole cycle. As you guys might know, um, sometimes when you go shopping on Zara or something like that, they also similarly provide the names of their suppliers and um, where they source the material from, but it's not always entirely truthful. And so having a third party, for example, like the European Union to introduce the digital product passport allows for greater accountability in the whole supply chain. Another thing that um, they've really stressed is extended producer responsibility. It means that fast fashion companies and everybody who's hiring the garment workers and sourcing all of these textiles need to be placed on a higher level of accountability legally and financially so that they're not just, you know, calling their clothes green and sustainable to get people to buy them and then still, you know, continuing to abuse their workers and the climate. So that's kind of pretty much the bulk of what, um, you know, really, really um, in tune with the growth. Another thing that I'd love to bring up since Ferris mentioned polyester pollution is that the European Union is actually going to be releasing another document specifically on microplastic pollution from polyester clothing uh, later this year because um, the shedding of microplastics from polyesters has now been classified as a major health concern. As you guys might know, earlier this year, scientists in Sweden actually found traces of microplastics in human blood for the first time in history. And the truth is, I can tell you this as a biologist, at this time, we simply don't know the long-term repercussions of having these foreign particles in our system. But I think I can safely say that it's probably not good to have them in there. So that's about all from this document. And I think Maxine can go ahead and kind of explain how this kind of relates to degrowth on a more personal level. Yeah, I think, thank you. Thank you, Sophie, for um, elaborating a bit more on the EU uh, strategy. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so as I just elaborated a bit on uh, degrowth, degrowth is more of like a general 
framework um not only like uh tapping into the fashion industry but it is specifically advocating for a very big reduction of fast fashion and i think that this policy is really tapping tapping on like all different elements uh what Tanvi just mentioned mentioned with a digital passport, with the extended producer responsibility, uh, looking into ways of recycling, um, more transparency for consumers. So it's it's making it um, much easier to um, uh, actually prefer or um, making uh, the uh, health for um, humans and the environment uh, above profit. So I think it's a step in a good direction. Um, so this was a lot of information maybe to digest for now, uh, but for those that were not familiar with it, we're just going to make it a bit more interactive and go into activity three. Uh, so even though you've just now had bits and pieces of uh, degrowth and the EU strategy, um, you can just write down uh, on what you think it includes or what your thoughts on it are. So. Also, Jeanette, for you, uh, if you cannot access the board, the question is, what can youth and youth NGOs do to take part in this policy process? Um, so maybe if you have some thoughts, maybe we can just write some things down in the first two minutes and then have a discussion on it. This is shaking around. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Um, are we already going back to the main room in like nine minutes? Oh, seven minutes left. Oh, okay. oh seven minutes. Seven. Maybe we should speed up the process yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, well, there. We have good enough ideas. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good brain dump, I think. Um, maybe we can quickly just go through it a little bit because I saw some wonderful ideas. Mm -hmm. So the topics I mainly see are awareness. So awareness to consumers on the importance of sustainable fashion, advocacy, campaigning, and leading by example, really good one. Possibly mainstreaming secondhand clothing shops. Um, That's a really good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just get informed on the strategy and push for its implementation, uh, find the elements that they prioritize, because also it, of course, incorporates a lot of different elements. Um, find a local NGO or even as an individual lobby to your local government about the issues. Seed money for businesses aiming on textile or recycling textiles. That's a really good one. Um, hosting cross collaborative policy workshops such as this one with people across the world, working collaboratively with EU citizens who can engage in the consultation process. Yeah, and bringing in diverse cohorts of people, policymakers, scientists and brands all play a part, support the policy through the network. Yeah, I think they're all really valid points. Um, and we can uh, take this even a bit to our next element. So activity four, uh, what would you like to ask your local representative regarding your government's policy on the various gaps in the fashion industry? So your local representative could be someone from your lo local government or your national government, or maybe local representative from an NGO such as Fashion Revolution or another one that's advocates for action. So what would we like um, to ask them specifically? We can write some thoughts down, maybe in one minute or something. <laughs> Mm, because we are a little short on time, I'm just going through them already. So some things written down, ban polyester, if only. Currently there is like 60% of uh, <laughs> textiles are made of polyester. So um, it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, what is the government doing in regards to pollution by, by the fashion industry? Um, what is the possibility of enacting EPR policy and which level of government is mandating it? Um, and then uh, what's the local national government going to do to actually implement it and how can they support other countries uh, to implement uh, a strategy like this uh, outside of the EU? Um, I think maybe for the last two minutes, we can still... Uh, write some things down um, in the box on the right, which is youth policy process. We can, until we're drawn back to the main screen, uh, write some, uh, draw, 
so draw some uh, thoughts on uh, the ideas in the different sections. So how to address the gap, who holds the power, and what are some different implications? So if you have some thoughts on this, just put it down. Oh, we have one more minute. Mm. Okay, so maybe how to, okay, who holds the powers, distributors, trade organizations, and governments? Um, what are the direct implications? Exposing fast fashion and the harm done by the industries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, stakeholders is everyone but it should be um, pushed by industry and government policies to initiate the movement. I think we can now leave the breakout room. So Ferris <laughs> and also Tanvi, of course, thank you for um, your contribution. Um, and I think uh, you'll know how to stay in touch with YFCA, but we have an Instagram and a LinkedIn, so you can follow us there. And um, yeah, it would be lovely to, um, Keep up with the work. <laughs> All right, perfect. Okay, bye bye.
That was great. Thanks, guys. I learned quite a bit. I read through some of the EU stuff before, but not in that much detail. So it was great to go over that and see some of the different um, policies they're trying to enact. I didn't know that part about the microplastics, although it's good they're doing that because it's crazy that there's microplastic in people's blood. So that's definitely yeah. a good part of it. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you liked it. They're actually, they're going to release a whole thick ass document about it later in this year, just because there's so much information to unravel as well. I think we should, mm. we should, we can definitely um, circulate that on our social media as well. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Um, wonderful. Okay, so I think most people are back from the breakout rooms. I'm just gonna take a quick look. Um, amazing. Okay, they'll be closing in two seconds. Um, from what I gathered, because I went to a few different ones, the conversation was so enriching, um, so many great discussions, and I love the um, cross-cultural and international presence in some of the rooms, so that's great. Um, so before we wrap up, I'm just going to let um, Isabel and Sarah take it away with regards to some solutions that we have. But um, before we get to that, I just want to say um, this event was brought to you by Threading Change and Fast Revolution, but this is our amazing Threading Change team. Um, in this picture is made up of all um, amazing badass women, but we also have um, several men who join our team as well, um, which is awesome. And we're currently hiring for different volunteers in a few different paid positions. So go to the next slide, um, Isabel or Sarah, you'll see that um, there's different opportunities to be involved. You can just go to bit.ly slash TC jobs board and we can input those in the chat as well. If you like today's session, we want to get involved with future sessions. Um, we're already thinking of some possible discussion pieces just because of how um, international this event was. We would love to do more. So if you want to collaborate, reach out to any of the other collaborators, let us know and we'll be happy to set something up. And um, I will let Sarah take it away with some of the solution pieces as well before we go into the ending part. Likely, uh, Isabel have some nice content to speak about here. Um, I just wanted to give you a few kind of housekeeping things to let you know for the end of the uh, this uh, workshop. We will be sending you a email uh, within the afternoon, basically, um, that will have a survey in it. We do ask that you guys fill that out. It does really help our organization kind of understand the good takeaways people have from our events and things we can work on in future. Uh, so definitely fill that out, look out for it. The mural will also be uh, saved as a PDF and shared to you. So you'll all have this wonderful resource from all five breakout rooms uh, that you can look back at and uh, you know go through the other breakout rooms and see what was discussed. Uh, we do compile a contact list and a links list as well from the chat. So if you do put your LinkedIn or any information for contact in the chat, we will share that with uh, all of the attendees today, but that's the extent of it's being shared uh, and any link that was shared in this chat today. So any articles um, or resources for further kind of work in this sphere will all be uh, in the email as well. So make sure you check that out after. I will let uh, Isabel jump in here and uh, add in some more stuff. Yeah, so thank you so much everyone for joining us today and collaborating with us. Thank you so much to all our workshop facilitators for taking the time out of your day to help us um, enrich this conversation and get an idea of how we can get started on policy within the fashion industry and also just do a deep dive into some of these frameworks. I really enjoyed the room I was in. We had some great conversation and our education program at Threading Change that I'll be starting to develop is a lot of this cross collaboration and knowledge building and knowledge sharing. And it's very similar to what we did today. It will consist of workshops, but also a, you could say like a committee of how youth can get involved in different aspects and in different projects. And basically through this cross collaboration with Threading Change and a youth group or a school, we have the opportunity to create a space where they can contribute to the conversation and contribute to the solutions as well. So yeah, that's what we have in store. And we also have many different programs like our membership network coming up along the pipeline and also developing the GISM, 
and continuing to add those amazing brands and organizations to our wonderful map. Um, but yeah, so many different things that connect to how we can build on this fashion industry and really change the way it's laid out right now and completely redesign it. So thank you so much again for being here. Here are some links that you can always go to to learn more about Threading Change and what we're doing, as well as the Good Close Fair Pay, which is a very important campaign happening right now. And hopefully we'll be seeing more coming in the next couple of months with them. And then of course, because it's Fashion Revolution Week and we um, had this wonderful collaboration with them, we want to make sure that you can check out all the different events that they have throughout the week. It's still going on till Sunday, so check out them. And yeah, thank you so much for being here and for sharing this space with us. And again, the facilitators, you are amazing. Thank you so, so much. And yeah. I will jump in one more time here as well. Um, just a reminder as well, if you did miss our earlier event this week for Fashion Revolution Week uh, with Threading Change, it's called Redistributing Money and Power in Fashion. It was a panel discussion. Uh, we hosted on Tuesday. It was a wonderful event discussing who has power in the industry and and basically you know everything we worked on in the breakout rooms today of who we have to target to see these gaps between the reality of fashion and what we want to see be closed and change uh, so that is available on our youtube as well if you want to go back and watch that i will link it in the chat for you here as well if you want to uh, continue to digest some fashion revolution content this week um, and we hope to see you at our upcoming events uh, tomorrow on our, our Instagram for some IG lives uh, for Earth Day, and then also next Wednesday for a wonderful Wow Wednesday uh, with one of our representatives here today from Remake. Um, and then also next Saturday, maybe Sophia would like to talk about this more, but we do have an in-person event uh, in Vancouver. Absolutely. So next Saturday, we have um, our first ever in-person threading change event, which feels so crazy to say because we've been in COVID for so long. Um, I'm just going to quickly share my screen so you can all see. Um, it is our clothing swap. It will be in person in Vancouver at a music studio. There will be DJs, there will be music, there will be food. Um, just a great way for the community to get together and just meet everyone in person and also meet the Threading Change community. Um, and we couldn't have done this event today without our amazing facilitators. So I figured to wrap up, maybe we can get each of the facilitators of the rooms to share for one minute, um, you know, what they discuss, what they learn, what they talk about, um, and also opportunity to share some of their links as well. Um, I know there was several different takeaways. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be a great, nice way to wrap it up. So we'll go in order. We'll have Yuda and Emily from Remake go first. You go oh, ahead. Okay. Um, okay. I'll, I'm the first person, so I'm going to have to think about what I have to say. Um, no, I think this was such a great um, opportunity. And I was talking to Emily about this, that, you know, when it comes to um, policy work and especially talking about accountability, transparency, something that um, I myself am always learning about this and being able to speak with folks from different parts of the, the world is amazing to see that there's so much work happening. And I'm just in a small little like pub in, in Canada, but um, I got to learn so much of, um, from the attendees from our breakout room. And so I'm really grateful to have to share this space. Um, yes, if you want to follow my links, I think I put it in the chat just now. I'm on Instagram at it's Yuda. So it's I-T-S-Y-U-D-D-H-A. And you can find all the work that I do there, but just want to say thank you all for um, letting me come on and join in this workshop. It was amazing and uh, yeah. And I was pretty much going to say the same thing. It was such a um, wide range of people in our group from all over the world, which is so incredible. Um, so thank you all so much for joining. Um, I'm on Instagram at Emmeru McKay, E-M-E-R-O-O. -O. I put it on the chat as well. Um, and while we're shamelessly self-plugging, I also own a store here in uh, Kelowna, BC. If you're based in the Okanagan or if you find yourself over here in Kelowna, um, it is a pre-loved um, luxury clothing store called Most Wanted. I'll pop it in the chat as well. Thank you so much for having me. Amazing. Thank you. Um, next up, uh, David from Shaping Fashion. Would you like to go next? Just wrap up what you talked about, how you're feeling. 
Of course. Um, so this was a very, very, very insightful session. Um, many thanks to everyone who joined in the room. And thank you so much to Kayleigh for taking such bomb notes. Um, so yeah, we basically just spoke at length um, about how you know inclusivity in terms of um, crafting policies and implementing policies is also important, um, especially for you know people, um, artisans in the global south, which are usually the most um, affected by um, issues um, in the global supply chain. So this was really interesting. Um, there are also moments where you know it seemed as if there are going to be collaborations going after. I look forward to connecting with so many of them. Um, so my I put my Instagram in the chat box. Um, and I think if you scroll upwards, I'm also on LinkedIn as well. So yeah, this is a really, really, really great one. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, and as Sarah Rose mentioned, we'll be sharing some of those links for different policy not Paul, sorry, a letter writing templates that Fashion Revolution has put together in the chat as well, and also in the post of an email so you can keep the conversation growing and also look at it from a solutions lens. Um, next up, Anna from Fashion Takes Action. I'm super interested in this topic with EPR policy, so I was in there for a little bit. Um, and Anna, on to you. Thank you, Sophia, and thanks so much for having me today. Um, it was, yeah, it was great to just be connected with everyone and and share the space like everyone was saying uh, it's very inspirational to see everyone kind of working towards similar goals um so yeah we we had a intimate discussion about uh, epr policy and i i shared a bit about the circularity work that we're doing um with our um, textile recycling pilot project um and how it's it's on a very local scale in in ontario right now but uh we'd love to see more projects like this and and you know the circularity world grow so um yeah check out our website i shared a couple links uh to our um uh, feasibility or textile feasibility recycling report um and then we're having a couple events coming up soon one of them is our youth summit which is a free event um on May 27th, and then our uh, World Ethical Apparel Roundtable, our WEAR event, um, is virtual in May, uh, and students get a discount, so check that out. Um, and yeah, feel free to follow, I added my LinkedIn, uh, and our Fashion Takes Action Instagram, so um, yeah, looking forward to keeping in contact with all of you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and Anna's organization, Fashion Takes Action, has done some really interesting work with EPR policy um, in Canada. So definitely reach out to her if you have any questions about that. Um, and next up, we have Alexia from Fashion Revolution Canada, um, one of the folks that helped make an event possible through our collab with Fashion Revolution Canada. So on to you, Alexia. Hi, everybody. Yeah, we had a really, really great conversation. It was only a couple of us, but it was really nice and intimate. And I feel like I got the opportunity to ask as many questions as you know I wanted to as well. So I feel like I definitely learned from our conversation. Um, we talked about what sustainable fashion kind of looks like in our different corners of the world and what the conversation looks like as well. Um, and what we personally think needs to be done from both like a community perspective um, and also like government and policy. Um, we kind of focused on like the difference between India and Canada and you know where we kind of are in the process of that. So I wanted to thank the uh, few of you that were in my room. It was small, but we had a really good chat and I really appreciated it. Um, you guys can find me on Fashion uh, Revolution Canada's Instagram, or I also added my LinkedIn there or Alexia Khan on Instagram. You can find me there too, but thank you so much for having me. This was really great. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Maxine and Tandy that are spearheading YHCA. Um, um, I think both of them are, are based in Europe, correct me if I'm wrong. So it's great to have some European representation, especially on some of the good close fair pay aspect. Um, I'm just going to highlight the video and um, yeah, take, take it away, Maxine. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so we talked about degrowth and uh, the new European strategy. So what's really important, what came out of our discussions is in order to keep within planetary boundaries, we really need to um, 
be okay with a little less um, and really uh, make sure that we're implementing this strategy and, uh, um, and acting upon it. So I think we had a fruitful discussion with our small group. Um, so what I would like to add to that is that YFCA is also working on a report uh, in which we want to um, create more transparency. And uh, in this, uh, we want to incorporate the voices of youth. Um, so also if you think you would like to contribute to that in any way, please reach out to us through our socials and uh, that would be wonderful to collaborate in that way as well. Tomvi, would you like to add anything? Um, I think that was really well said, Maxine, thank you. And this was a great opportunity. YFCA has just very recently take, um, started and our initial projects have been kind of more on ground based. This is actually a very first workshop. And so we really hope, you know, you guys enjoyed it. And we really hope that you can learn from this in the future and find out how you can really contribute to policymaking processes in your own country. Because as great as it is, for example, that we discussed the EU textile strategy, a lot of manufacturing in the world for garments is not done in the EU, it's done in Asia or in other regions. And so we need to make sure that the youth of the entire world or as many regions are connected to this cause so that they can reach out to their own governments. And so one day, instead of the EU textile strategy, maybe we could be discussing some kind of interconnected Asian textile strategy, and that would be amazing. Also, if you would, if you guys would like to join YFCA or help out, just reach us, just, sorry, reach out to us on our socials, LinkedIn, Instagram, and we'll be more than happy to have you. Yeah, and thank you so much, Starting Change um, and Fashion Revolution for inviting us. It was wonderful to be here. It really was. Amazing. Thank you so much both. Um, I could not have said it better myself. What a great wrap up. Um, and with that, I'm just going to share the last screen. So if you're interested in keeping up with future events, you can sign up for our newsletter. Um, I hope I'm sharing the right screen. Can anyone see the, the ending screen? <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Okay, oh. hold on one sec. If you're on my team, you know I always have an issue with sharing the right screen. I think it's this one. Can everybody see that? the newsletter link? No? Okay. No. Never mind. I'll have Sarah Rose post in the chat. <laughs> um, so if you would like to keep up to date with future events, you can go to threatingchange.org slash newsletter. Um, as we mentioned, we'll have our in-person clothing swap, which is uh, next Saturday. For future collaborations, we're all years. Well, I think this went super well. We're hoping to um, take some of the learnings from today. And as we said, we do have um, contacts within the UM that we hope you take some of these lessons too. I know some of the rooms that I've been in, um, the stuff that we talked about within the U and also just within Canada was really great. Um, so also be always be continuous ways to engage. You can go on our website, send for a newsletter. If you follow us on our socials, you'll see all of that. Um, we'll be sending out a contacts list with all this information. So if you didn't get a chance to write down people's content info, do not worry, that'll be all sent out to you. And we will just always love for more ways to collaborate. Um, and with that, thank you to our facilitators, to our attendees, to our note takers, to everyone. This was great. And we're wishing you a great rest of Fashion Revolution Week. Yeah. And a little applause to all of our facilitators, please. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone have a great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.